today as we come to the table. You see, when it came to Abraham and his belief in his God, he was humbled by it because he understood who God was and who he was. And let me say this, those that are truly great in the kingdom of God are the men and the women that are humble before God. Not those who lift themselves up, but those that are humble before the Lord. You've been around them. I've seen them before. I love being around. Uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to be around more than once several times with Franklin Graham. And something I've noticed about Franklin Graham is his humility. And this is something you can't fake. You know, you can't pretend to be humble. I mean, you can and maybe trick people for a while, but you can sense when someone truly doesn't think they're anything great, they're just doing what they're called to do. And that's the presence you get there. Are you feeling like you've got everything figured out when it comes to your faith? It's easy to fall into the trap of pride, thinking that we know all there is to know about God and our relationship with Him. But as Pastor Mark talks about in today's message, there's always more to learn, and that's where humility comes in. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us. As we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, Senior Pastor of Calvary Knoxville. Humility is key to growing in our walk with the Lord. When we approach Him with a humble heart, we open ourselves up to His teachings and His love. We recognize that we don't have all the answers and we're willing to learn from the wisdom of others. It's only when we set aside our own pride that we can truly grow in our faith. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Genesis chapter 23 with today's edition of Come to the Table. Now, I don't know what it is in our society and culture today that says, be strong, don't cry. God doesn't say that. Be, uh, weeping is not a, string, a sign of weakness. As a matter of fact, the Bible says when Lazarus died that Jesus wept. So weeping is not a sign of weakness. Weeping is a human emotion. And so we need to make sure that we allow that a human emotion to operate because when we do that, it opens up the door for the healing process. Note this. God never told us we shouldn't weep. He simply said that when we do, we should not sorrow as those who have no hope. You see, we're different from the world. They weep with no hope. We weep knowing, you know what? There's a tear right now. But as the Bible says, there's joy in the morning. And that is, this is going to pass away. This is just temporary. And so we have to recognize that when it comes to death. Weeping is okay. We don't have to be strong and hold back the tears. Let God minister and, and to minister to your heart through that. But notice there in verse 3, it also says, after he was weeping and mourning, notice this, then Abraham stood up from before his dead. It literally means to arise. What is my point? Note this, believer. Yes, we're to weep. Yes, we're to mourn. But we need to follow the example of Abraham. After the weeping and mourning, it's time to rise up. Although we've been bent down with sorrow, we need to rise up, or literally the word means here, to arise. And notice he takes care of business. Now, what is the point? We weep and we mourn, but when the weeping and mourning is done, we stand up and move on. Again, this doesn't mean that there's not real mourning and weeping that last even for quite some time. This is not saying that we can't be real humans and we're to pretend nothing happened and I'm okay, don't worry about me. We need to be praying for each other and encouraging each other. And these things take time. It may take quite a bit of time to get over the loss of one that we love. But after the weeping is done, our eyes and our heart and our mind have got to be fixed on arising and moving on for what God has for our life from this point on, or it can overwhelm us. To remain in a state of mourning and weeping for too long will cause depression and will pull us down. And once we get beyond that normal time of mourning and weeping, we need to be able to say, all right, it's time to move forward. So the balance is, yes, we mourn and we weep. But then when the mourning and weeping time is done, we get up and we get going because it's time to move on for what God has in the next season of our life. And again, I know this isn't very, doesn't happen overnight. I realize that. And I certainly don't mean to present this in an insensitive way. But the reality is if we allow ourselves to wallow in our sorrow, we're going to be destroyed emotionally, 
and in any usefulness for the Lord. So again, we have to make sure, even as Abraham did, that we rise up and that we move forward. And so notice after he arises, it's interesting to me, Abraham here says, I am a foreigner and a sojourner among you. Now it's interesting here that he mentions he's a foreigner and a sojourner because the Bible tells us God gave him all the land. If God gave Abraham all the land, why does Abraham refer to himself as a sojourner and a foreigner? Because he didn't have the land yet. And what's interesting, when you follow Abraham's life, while he was in his earthly body, he never received the land or the promise of God. Neither did Sarah. And you might say, but wait a minute, did God break his promise? I thought God promised him the land. No, God promised him the land, but we need to understand the promises of God don't always come when we expect them. And Abraham's particular promise is not even going to be granted and has not even been granted yet until Jesus Christ comes back in the second coming. Now think about this. The Bible says the Lord's going to come back in the second coming. He's going to establish his earthly kingdom here on the earth for a thousand years and we will rule and reign with him. Guess who will also be there? Abraham. You're going to see Abraham, Moses, Elijah, Elisha. All these guys are going to be there with us, Jesus said, gathering in this millennial kingdom. And that is when Abraham will be awarded the land that God promised him. Is that not neat? Now, here's what's neat to me, and it never hit me until the teaching this morning, actually, in the midst of it. But that is, we're going to see Abraham receive the promise of God. We'll be there with him. That's exciting. And yet Abraham died without receiving that promise. God is faithful to his promises, you can be sure. But again, they don't always happen in our timing or when we think they're going to happen. And Abraham here realizing, hey, I'm a foreigner. I'm just a sojourner. This is not my land yet, but one day it will be. Remember when Jesus was being tried, they said to him, you know, are you a king? You know, he said, look, he said, I'm not a king of this earth right now. He said, if I was, my, my, my servants would fight. But one day he will be. And when he comes back to rule and reign, we will rule and reign with him. So this is exciting. This is also interesting in light of those who say there is no literal thousand-year reign of Christ because if there is not a literal thousand-year reign of Christ, God cannot fulfill his promise to Abraham. And I can assure you this, although you know it, God is faithful to his promises. And so Abraham says, I am a foreigner and a sojourner. And notice verse 5, And the sons of Heth answered Abraham, saying, Well, hear us, my Lord, you're a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of burial places. None of us will withhold from you your, uh, his burial place that you may bury your dead. Now notice this. First of all, they recognize he's a mighty prince among them. And because of that, they say, you know what? Pick which you know, one you want. We'll give you a burial place among ours. Not that he would be given theirs to keep, but given one that he could use. And what do you mean? Well, that might sound morbid in the way we do the funerals today because we have one grave and we bury them in that. Not so back then. You would have a family sepulcher. You'd have a family tomb, if you will. And you would take those that died that you love. You would put them in them when they died or put them in there. And then when they, after they had, uh, again, turned back to dust, they would go in and take the remains, which are only the bones, put them in a, a container, an ossuary, and they would move them to the back of the tomb. And then when the next family member died, you would simply go in there and put them in there. And they said, hey, use one of ours. You know, you, you, that, that's okay. We'll be happy to give it to you because, again, we respect you and you're a prince in the land. And again, it shows how they viewed Abraham, what his testimony was. They saw the hand of God on him. They realized that he was a prince in the land and they were giving him that honor. But Abraham didn't want a temporary tomb. You see, the only one I know of that needed a tomb for a weekend was Jesus Christ. All he needed to do was borrow one for three days. But most of us need something that's a little bit longer lasting. And so what happened with Abraham is like, I appreciate your generosity, but I want to buy a tomb that I might bury Sarah in. And again, it would be a family tomb. And we know that others were buried in there as well. And that's how that typically operated. And so again, they said to him, you know, whatever you want, we'll give it to you. You're a prince in the land. They saw the hand of God on him. They recognized that he was lifted up by the Lord. And notice this verse 7. And this is one of the things that we need to recognize that made Abraham great before man and great before God. Notice what it says. Then Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, the sons of Heth. They had just told him he's a prince, but he's bowing to them. What is this a sign of? Humility. You see, when it came to Abraham and his belief in his God, he was humbled by it because he understood who God was and who he was. And let me say this. Those that are truly great in the kingdom of God are the men and the women that are humble before God. Not those who lift themselves up 
but those that are humble before the Lord. You've been around them. I've seen them before. I love being around. Uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to be around more than once several times with Franklin Graham. And something I've noticed about Franklin Graham is his humility. And this is something you can't fake. You know, you can't pretend to be humble. I mean, you can and maybe trick people for a while. But you can sense when someone truly doesn't think they're anything great, they're just doing what they're called to do. And that's the presence you get there. This was like Abraham. He wasn't there pretending to be something greater than he was or trying to lift himself up. Abraham was humble before them and he bowed himself before them. You know, in 1 Peter 5, verse 5, it says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so God shows his favor on those that will humble themselves. If we allow pride to come in and do not humble ourselves, God will bring us down. If we humble ourselves and allow God to work through that humility, God will lift us up when the time is right. And I can say this, even if you're, you know, you may receive temporary adulation in this world by pride, but it will not be eternal adulation or praise or honor before God in heaven. Abraham was a man who received eternal honor, and even we're honoring him today because of his humility based in his faith in his God. How different that is that uh, this article I read this week, maybe you read the article about John Travolta where he was boasting and bragging because of being involved in Scientology and his religion. He said, he said, I'm as big a star as Elvis Presley and Marilyn Monroe. And he said, but the reason I haven't met the same fate they have is because of my religion. And he was talking about, again, Scientology. Now, again, here he is bragging and boasting in himself and his position that he's in, in this, in this false religion that, again, uh, is not helping him any with God. But the point is, is that he's boasting and bragging about how great he is. And again, I'm not lifting up Elvis and Marilyn Monroe. They're certainly not the role models we should follow. But to sit there and say I'm as great as whatever the people see in the earth as being great is an obvious sign of pride rather than humility. What I find interesting about it is, as I had this particular, and what a contrast to Abraham. But what I find interesting, I had this article on my desk, again, because it was such a contrast to Abraham and his faith and what John Travolta was talking about in his faith. And my daughter was standing there and she said, well, I've heard of Elvis and Marilyn Monroe, but who is John Travolta? <laughs> And I thought, that is poetic justice, is it not? <laughs> he thinks he's so great and they hadn't even heard of him. I love it. But anyway, so again, true greatness, humility. Jesus said this, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, be the servant of all. It's hard to be, to think you're great when you're serving everyone else, isn't it? Now, if you understand the kingdom, you know that you're, you're great if you're serving everyone else. But it's not an issue of pride. It's an issue of realizing this is how God views things. But again, down in this world, it's having people serve you that makes you seem great. Not so when it comes to true greatness. But also notice the character uh, of Abraham that stands out here in this. Because again, they said, you're a prince in the land. Take any of the, of, of the you know, sepulchers that you want and we'll, we'll give them to you to use. And yet we see that Abraham says, you know what? I'm not going to do that because he realized that wasn't the right thing to do. He needed to pay for this particular place to bury his wife. And why do I bring that up? Because note this, God is the one who gives position and God is the one who gives authority and God is the one who gives favor. And when God gives that, it must never be misused or abused. Abraham had an opportunity right here where he could have abused his authority. He could have said, well, I'm glad you noticed I'm a prince. And yes, I'll take that. And thank you very much. And, and what else can I get from you? Listen, some of you are leaders in here in different areas. Some of you are bosses at your place and work. Some of you have honor bestowed on you and position bestowed on you. We need to make sure that we never take advantage of others because of the position we've been given because one day we're going to be accountable to God. This is where a lot of politicians get in trouble. They take advantage of the position they've been put in. It should never be so. Abraham was not that type of man. Abraham knew he had the position. He knew he was a prince before them. He could have accepted this generous offer and taken advantage of them. But instead of taking advantage of them, he said, you know what, I'm not going to do that because I know it's not the right thing to do. And, and it's interesting here when he asked for this, notice Abraham says to them, he says, he bowed himself before them and said in verse 8 there, he said, if it is your wish that I bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and meet with Ephron, the son of Zohar, uh, for me. That, I may give, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he has, which is at the end of his field. Notice this. All that Abraham is asking for is this cave at the end of the field. And he says, let him give it to me at the full price as property for a burial place among you. And again, notice he says, I need to pay for this. The right thing to do is pay for this and to pay for this at the full price. But again, all he's asking for was the cave at the end of the field. Now notice this sneaker, Ephron. Now Ephron dwelt among the sons of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the presence of the sons of Heth and all who entered at the gate. By the way, all the business transactions were done in the gate in that day. These are where the legal transactions would take place. He said to all those uh, who had entered the gate, and he said, No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field and the cave 
that is in it. I give it to you in the presence of the sons of my people. I give it to you, bury your dead. Now this may sound magnanimous at first. Wow, what a great gesture. I give you not only the cave, but I give you the field. No, understand what was happening here is they would haggle and bargain for what the thing to be sold and the sale price was going to be in that day. And this was Ephron's way of getting more out of Abraham. You see, all Abraham wanted was the cave. He says, all of a sudden out of the blue, oh, I'll give you the cave and the field and let's discuss the price. And he said it in front of everyone. See, now Abraham's on the spot. Either Abraham has to haggle and argue, say, no, I only want the cave, or he has to go along with what Ephron is doing. And I've seen them do this. You know, it's interesting. Over in the Middle East, we've had a chance when we go over there on the Israel trips, you'll go through the shopping areas. And, but you need to kind of have a little bit of education on how they do things. They'll typically start out way more than what they want for it, and they want you to argue back and forth. And they'll tell you what a dick, ridiculous price you know, you, you're offering if you offer too low or whatever, and they'll haggle with you back and forth. That's a part of the game. It's a part of the process. But sometimes they'll not only get you in this haggling match, they'll even try to get you to buy stuff you don't want. I remember Tracy sharing one time, she went into a place and wanted to buy this article and they were like, oh, you want that one? Well, what's wrong with this one? <laughs> it's like, I don't want that one, I want this one. Oh no, come, come, look at this one. And so we see a lot of it going on here, this Middle Eastern kind of, you need the field too, Abraham. And not only does he want to give him the field, you see, he's gonna get more money out of him. So this is part of the bargaining process, although it may seem magnanimous, it's actually quite sneaky. Now, there's a couple of reasons. It could be that he's offering him the field with the cave, although Abraham wanted, just simply wanted the cave. According to Hittite law, if you were a Hittite and owned land, and not everyone owned land, you were obligated to be in the military. Now, what kind of thing would that be if we did that today? If you bought land, you'd be in the military. How many people would forego and rent? Well, you can imagine, this guy owns land, he's in the military, it might have been an opportunity to get out. I mean, he might have been one of those guys that wanted to like, you know, wear a dress and high heels around at the lineup. So they say, look, you're a nut, get out of here. But the bottom line is, hey, why don't you take the field and the cave? Maybe this was some type of attempt on Ephron's, uh, you know, part to get out of military duty. But really, I believe the main reason was simply to take advantage of Abraham. And that is, he saw a man that was weeping and mourning and grieving. And he's taking advantage of him. You know, I think one of the worst things that can happen is someone to take advantage of those that are weeping and mourning. And this is where I give you another warning. As a brother in the Lord, when you come to the day that a loved one dies, I think it's wise that you have already made plans in advance. Maybe, maybe not necessarily going out and purchasing everything. I'm not saying that. That's a personal decision on you. And some even say that purchasing in advance today may not be the wisest because of financial reasons. And some say, no, it is the wisest. That's not the issue here. Here's the issue. Make up your mind what type of funeral you're going to have before you get there. Because oftentimes, especially if it's sudden, those that are trying to take advantage can sell you things you don't need. And have you spending a lot more money. One of the greatest concerns I have as a pastor when someone in the body dies is I want to share that with them. I want to say, would you like me to go with you when you buy the casket or let me at least give you a warning because I have heard of, sadly enough, and none here in Knoxville. So again, I certainly have not heard of anything like that happening in Knoxville. I'm not mentioning any names or anything. But over the years as a pastor, I have heard of some that will take advantage of those weeping and mourning and try to sell them a, a better casket than they ever would have really bought and spend multiple dollars that they didn't need to spend. Again, the kind of casket you want to buy for your loved one, that's between you. And I think it's whatever you want to spend, that's between you and the Lord. But be prepared for it mentally so that you don't make an emotional decision and be taken advantage of. And I think that Ephraim was taking advantage of Abraham. Abraham, your wife just died. You want a place to bury her? There's the cave. Well, how about the field and the cave? We're going to sell everything to you. And again, it's a, it's a tough situation here. And so notice what happens. He said, no, take it all, the field, everything, bury your dead. Sounds great, but we know the heart behind it. Then Abraham bowed himself down before the people of the land, again, showing his humility. And he spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, if you will give it, please hear me. I will give you money for the field. Take it from me, and I will bury my dead there. Notice his humility. I'm not going to fight with you. I'll simply bury my dead there, and that's the thing to do, and so I'm going to do that. And we see the, the heart of Abraham here in, this, in the midst of this situation. Abraham was a wealthy man, and no doubt Ephron knew Abraham was a wealthy man. And so again, taking advantage of him, but Abraham allowing it to happen. And notice Ephron answered Abraham, saying to him, My Lord, listen to me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver, but what's that between you and me? So bury your dead. Now, if he really didn't want the money, why did he mention the price? <laughs> I'd like you to have this car. It's, it's worth 10000 but I don't know what that's... If you want it, you can have it. Now, why would you tell somebody that? 
Because you want to get $10,000. That's exactly why. And so now we see Ephron here pretending that he's being magnanimous, but again, actually trying to get money out of Abraham in this attempt in the sell of the lamb, you know, sell of the land. It's, it's interesting, according to James H. Freeman, he's the author of Manners and Customs of the Bible, this was as much as three to four times greater the actual value of the land. And so again, we see him taking great advantage here. But Ephron's goal, again, was to get an exorbitant price for the land because he knew that Abraham had it, and so he charges this ridiculous fee. And I find it interesting that even the name Machpelah, which he was buying the, the, the cave in Machpelah, the field in Machpelah, it means literally double. And now we see this Ephron the Hittite trying to get double and maybe even more out of Abraham as he makes this purchase. You know, I had a similar experience in the ministry some years ago where someone offered to do something free for the church. I want to do it free. It's in my heart. I want to do it free. And it's like, wow, that's really magnanimous. That's a great offer. But you know what? It wouldn't be right to do it free. This is too big of a job. And so we want to pay you. And by the time we got done negotiating for the payment, it was more than double of what the actual worth would have been for the job from anyone else. And when you see this kind of thing happen, you begin to wonder about the motives. Why was it offered free and ended up double the price of everything else? I think maybe you're dealing with Ephron. And so you have to be aware of that. Now, fortunately, it fell through before it made it very far in that process. But I remember thinking at that time, we need to handle this the right way. And I got some wise counsel from someone who said, listen, when you settle this, make sure you go over and above board. Why? You need to be a testimony because this is the testimony of Calvary Chapel. And so what I did was I hired a professional in that area and I said, now you look at these, what this person has done. Give me the price of what it's worth at the highest price. Not just the price of what, you give me the highest price for what this work would be that someone has done. He gave me the highest price, I doubled it. And again, why did I do that? Because I realized I didn't want any opportunity for anyone to ever accuse Calvary Chapel of wrongdoing when it came to our business dealings. Now, you might be saying, Mark, you're crazy. As a matter of fact, this particular individual that I had to do this for me, uh, this professional that, that figured out what the price should be, he said to me, you're crazy. He said, already I gave you a high price. for." He said, you shouldn't even pay that for it. This is nothing. He said, why are you doubling it? I said, because here's the bottom line. The testimony of Calvary Chapel and the way we deal with people is much more important than whether or not we're done right in this particular situation. In other words, guys, realize this. Souls are much more important than money. And if we allow money to dictate whether what we do when it comes to our business transactions, we're going to be in trouble. Now, does that mean, okay, Mark, we let everyone take advantage of us? No. You can't let every crook that comes down the path take advantage of the church or take advantage of you individually. But the bottom line is, is that the soul and the testimony is much more important than getting it right and getting what you deserve. And Abraham understood that. And Abraham said, you know what? There's all these people that are witnesses. I am an example of God right here. They all know that I'm a follower of God. And this is the deal we're going to make. God has made the provision for me to do this. We're going to do it. And now we see that he does it. So there are times when it's better to be done wrong and keep your testimony than to fight for your rights and lose it. And Abraham understood that, and now Abraham exercised that. And so notice what happens here in verse 16. So Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out the silver for Ephron, which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, the currency of the merchants. So the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave which was in it, and all the trees that were in the field which were within, and all the surrounding borders were deeded to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the sons of Heth before all who went into the gate of the city. It's always a blessing to have you come to the table of God's Word with us each and every day. Pastor Mark's been going through the book of Genesis, and there's much to learn and appreciate from this first book of the Bible. Sometimes to fully grasp something later on, you need to understand where things began. From verse 1, God made it clear that He was there all along, and He set things in motion exactly as He instructed. Isn't it neat to see that all of creation is under God's authority? That includes you. This could seem a bit intimidating, but it's actually God's way of looking out for your best interests. Once you look at it that way, you start to realize that everything in all of creation is something that God initiated with intention, and that includes you. What a great thing to come to today. If you missed any part of this message or would like to hear this one again, you can always go back and find it at thewaymedia.net. Just click on the Come to the Table tab. Another way to access these messages is by downloading the Way Media app 
from the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. By doing this, you'll be able to take these teachings with you wherever you go. Would you like to get in touch with us? Our number is 865-609-1385. Once more, that's 865-609-1385. Feel free to call us with questions or to even ask for prayer. Please come back for another edition where Pastor Mark will continue his teaching through the book of Genesis the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.